I V M. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. My name is Sudhishan. I am a junior research scholar with the Takshashila Institution and with me is Arushi, who is also a junior research scholar at the Takshashila Institution. Together, we work on the 20 million jobs project at Takshashila, where we research on how India can create 20 million jobs for our unemployed youth. So in a podcast before, we discussed about how the government in the recent elections is prioritizing unemployment. It has promised to fill all the vacant posts that are lying in government jobs. And otherwise, also the government is trying to create an environment where jobs can flourish and people can get employed. So we got thinking, is there a formal way that some interests, some people's interests proceed over others? To put it better, we were just wondering whether the government benefits from this kind of unemployment and uh, in this podcast, we will share thoughts on that. So, Arushi, do you have something to say about that? I actually do. So, this reminds me of a model that we learned for one of our courses, which is called the Selective Theory, which is put forward by Bruce Bionard in the Skeeter and Alistair Smith. It's this idea that when you think of any political system, you can divide things into a winning coalition, a selectivate, and the nominal people outside of that. So, the winning coalition is anyone who has a substantial say in getting you to power, whereas your selectorate is just anyone who has a nominal say, but your winning coalition is someone who really has the power to decide. And then you ha- obviously have the leader who is, you know, going to get elected. Now, if you were to think of a system like China, then over there, the Politburo or the 12 people that form the Politburo would be a winning coalition to ensure that you become the premier of China. On the other hand, in a country which is a democracy, you would think that while your selectorate is the entire population that is eligible to vote, the winning coalition would ideally be something like 51% of the country or in other systems, it could be say around 25%, 30%, depending on what electoral system that you have. Now, one would assume that interests of the elite or those who control finances or resources would function in the winning coalition of only autocracy since over there you're relying on those material resources to you know, to keep you in power. However, there's a more recent trend that has been pointed out by Tariq Tatchal as well, where overwhelmingly poor voters are voting for elite parties. So why is that happening? And I think that's the simple idea that while in democratic elections, we still rely on people voting for a party, the party doesn't have any accountability to the people themselves. And they tend to be controlled by other Western interests, such as getting financing for their campaigns, representing the interest groups of people that have helped them come to power because the electoral machinery doesn't just involve votes. It involves education campaigns. It involves media campaigns. It involves all of those things. And you have to keep the interests of those people in check as well. And I think that's where this whole idea of unemployment comes in. If you have high unemployment, uh, your winning coalition could be happy because it directly has a consequence that there is a very large pool of people that are looking for a job, which means that anybody who currently has a job can be easily replaced, which means that a person is less likely to also shirk if they already have a job. They're also going to be okay with lower wages. Because now if you know that you can be easily replaced and it's so hard to find another job, you would be okay with subpar conditions to work in a salary that may even be below minimum wage. And you may not even have a lot of job security or the safety nets that come with a well-paying job, especially in a country like India, where above 90% of our economy seems to operate in the unorganized sector. This is something we must consider. And lastly, it also keeps workers compliant. It lets inflation rise, but wages don't have to keep par with it. You also have other things where unionization is not allowed and unemployment tends to remain high. For instance, 
This has happened in India as well, where interests of industrialists were considered over the interests of workers, even back when India had just become an independent country. And that was simply because at that time, India needed to prioritize industrialization. It needed that spur. However, the precedent was set. At, since that time, workers' interests haven't been represented adequately in the government. So in that way, if you think about it, maybe the interests of the elite are being put in front of the interests of livelihoods for people where you aren't creating adequate jobs because it keeps your elite happy. It ensures that you can always pander these people through patronage goods, such as providing them with bicycles, a television set, maybe providing them with jobs through welfare policies or other pro-poor policies the government enacts. And this acts as this continuous sale of patronage goods, which uh, according to Kanchan Chandra, motivates a lot of politics in India. And I think maybe that's why the government isn't taking any concrete steps to probably do away with unemployment. And if one could say even that it is beneficial to the government to have unemployment. Um, what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts and those are very interesting points. So the primary thing that I was thinking about while you were speaking was Mandrega. I mean, that scheme has been there for a while. And we know that it's open to anyone, right? It's a welfare scheme and it's open to anyone who require, who can do some skilled labor. So when I was working in bank, I saw laborers used to get 6,000 rupees per month. And uh, that I think that is still the case, right? And I think that it largely benefits the government for such people to remain poor because it's low-cost labor that can be used for infrastructural projects. Additionally, these people will always, because they can't hit a standard of living, which probably we enjoy, they will always be on the lookout for any kind of employment benefit or you can even say ration supplies or whatever that the government can offer. And that can probably give them a lot of incentives to vote for this party in the next elections or any other, you know, just the support that they can garner. Additionally, I was just thinking that when I used to work in the bank and you know, hordes of laborers used to stand in line just to get the employment benefit of 6,000 rupees. I saw a stark difference between a really poor person as compared to someone who just doesn't have a job and right now they're relying on Panrega. What I saw was that the really poor persons actually had to come again and again to the bank to get to see whether they have got that 6,000 rupees or not. And uh, interestingly, I was reading a paper two days back on Manrega in Karnataka, and the findings were astounding. They found that the elite people, among the poor people who have been employed in Manrega, the, the considerably elite people, they generally tend to get better access to the kind of work that is doled out from the scheme. And they also have the support of Gram Panchayats and other political people who might be, you know, who might be there in their circles. And they also get the amount of money that they are compensated for their manual labor at the right amount of time. So despite the fact that they are working as much as the poor people who don't have access to such facilities, they have a whole of benefits that these people don't enjoy. So I think that definitely works in favor of the government. And that actually brings me to my next point, which I think you can explain better, which is elite capture, which is very prevalent in India. And I would like to hear your thoughts about that. So I think elite capture is a very prevalent thing today where we say that the interests of the elite are put over the interests of the masses. And a very prevalent form of elite capture, at least in India, is clientelism. Or the exchange of same material goods for electoral support becomes the criteria for distribution of certain public goods themselves. So Anderson Kotwal and a third author in 2015 had done a study in Maharashtra's villages where they tried to gather what was the impact of this elite capture on the provision and on the implementation of welfare schemes. A lot of the Gram Panchayat Employment Guarantee Scheme, yet it was noted that in places where there was an elite, where in this case, since it was Maharashtra, the elite was a Maratha head of the Gram Panchayat, it was seen that these policies weren't being implemented, which meant that the labor in the village was only relying on whatever agricultural labor he could get. And now if you knew that, say, whatever the employment guarantee scheme was probably paying you 200 rupees a day, if you knew that you can't get it, 
but you can get a lesser paying job as an agricultural labor where you can you have no job security to begin with. You would still take it because some money is better than no money. And they found that it meant that the accountability was completely removed from people wanting accountability from their leaders. But right now, the leaders were expecting accountability from the people themselves. So accountability has been reversed. Unemployment is prevalent. You are taking up jobs where you probably have hidden unemployment, you're underemployed. A lot of these factors tend to come in when we talk about clientelism, when we talk about elite capture. And I think that's something we do have to think about, that elite capture can be so perverse in how it factors in. Um, Patel also points out that a lot of these things also occur because elites will tend to favor parties, not because these parties are the only people they can favor because there's some ideological commitment within this party that the elites agree with. Yet, the masses tend to vote for these parties simply because of patronage goods. And now if you're voting in a party on the basis of it providing you with this patronage good and not for any legislative reform that it has promised, the government really has no incentive to come up with an unemployment policy that could do away with unemployment or a jobs policy that could really create 20 million jobs in this country. And I think that's what's important, that if your policies become dependent on the conscience of the elite, will we ever really have pro-poor policies that would want to do away with employment, unemployment in the country? I don't think so, but I also don't think this is just an India-centric problem. Like, while a, lo- a large part of our country does live below the poverty line and our unemployment numbers are really high at this point, I don't think it plays just India. I think you were telling me about a case study in Ghana. Do you want to maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, so I was reading about Ghana's economy and there are some points which are really incredible. So a layman knows that Ghana relies on cocoa production. It's a country where uh, cocoa is grown and the and just like India, the population really relies on agriculture for their economy. Now, wealth inequality in Ghana has been on the rise. In fact, unemployment has only tripled in the last decade. So it's very similar to India and it's happening because of elite capture. So women are being pushed more and more into poverty and they're not getting similar access to jobs like men. Just like India, people have migrated from the rural area to urban areas. But there's an anomaly there that actually it's the rural people who are doing much better economically than the urban people because jobs are not being created you know just like india ghana has been seeing a jobless growth pattern for a while now so um that actually brings me to the point that elite capture is very prevalent in third world countries and it creates wealth inequality and i think that kind of benefits the government and i can bring up i can point out a relation so in Ghana, the inequality is so bad that I was reading a report by Oxfam India, which showed that if you take one of the wealthiest men in Ghana as, and see his income for one month, it will take the poorest woman in Ghana to earn that much amount in thousand years. That's how bad the wealth inequality is in Ghana. And uh, it's I think it's pretty much similar to India that uh, the way the inequality gap is just keeps on rising. Rich people are holding most of the wealth in the country. And these are generally the elites, right? These are the people who decide basically what kind of, not not directly, but indirectly, they we can see what kind of policies are being passed. There's talks of privatization and all of these is happening. It's like indirectly, it's the elites who are running the country. And we know that political parties benefit from this because they are the ones who rely on donations. From such people. This is the reason why uh, there is no limit to corporate donation when it comes to electoral bonds. And there is no accountability either. These are anonymous donors, so we don't know where that money is coming from. But the ruling party is benefiting from that. There is data that shows that around 94.5% of the electoral bond money has gone to the ruling party. So, and, and we have seen that they have won elections back to back and they won in UP recently and a lot of that has happened because of the donations that they have received because they have been able to provide of freebies during COVID-19 pandemic in UP and they have created not maybe not intentionally but 
an environment has been created in UP where people are really deprived of jobs. And this is the reason why unemployment was the main issue in in these elections. It was the highlight of uh, BJP's manifesto. Now, we don't know whether they are going to give these jobs or not. First of all, they will fill the vacant vacancies, which we don't know whether they are going to fill or not. And I have lived in UP most of my life. I come from Lucknow and I know that it does not have an ecosystem where jobs can flourish. Else I would be working there, but I'm not. So um, what appears to me from the surface is that this was just another point for the government to win elections. And nothing really is being done about unemployment for the poor people. And it's the elite, especially, who are just flourishing with this entire fiasco that's happening. I would like to know if you have anything to add here. Yeah, I think when you said that, you know, like the UP in, in UP, BJP promise, you know, it promised that they would create, fill these vacancies, create more jobs and do away with the unemployment problem. I think it would, I think at the same time, one has to remember that the context of where these policies are being spoken of also really matters. So in a state where communal politics is so important, why exactly are they focusing so much on jobs could also be a question. And also the fact that if they know that they can get the support of the poor people by talking about job policies, wouldn't one call them as rational as an actor can get in this real world? Like, you know, the economic actor who's supposed to be rational and always think about the consequences of their actions. Isn't a politician doing exactly that if they know that by doing that, they can sway anyone on that left to right spectrum to come and vote for them because jobs is bipartisan. It's not something only one party will promise you. Both will promise you better jobs. Both will promise you better employment. Yet for one party to take this stand concretely and say that we're going to bring about change, I think that's quite interesting and maybe points to a changing trend in how elections will be fought, where hopefully these aren't just promises on paper, where we're actually focusing on better jobs for people. We're not focusing merely on pro-poor schemes that provide patronage goods or even themselves become a way of further elite capture because in places like India where class and caste identities are so strong, you can't say that they won't factor in when policies need to be implemented, especially in places where caste and class can be so heterogeneous and everyone needs some kind of job to come out of it. So I think the question then becomes, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think unemployment will become even more political than it is today? Do you think unemployment will only be something economists talk about? or And do you think there is some sort of political solution to the unemployment problem that we face today? Yeah, I think that unemployment is going to get worse. And we have seen that in the recent riots and and whatever has happened in the COVID-19 pandemic. Government jobs that, let's say, students from states like UP Bihar rely on, they are being pushed. I know a friend who's been preparing for SSC exam for like three years, but he hasn't got an opportunity to give the exam because it just keeps getting delayed. Now, these are people who are my age who have never had a job because people from Bihar generally rely upon uh, government jobs. I mean, this I read a report recently where the, it was mentioned that there's a tree and village called Bihar called Example, where uh, people go to study for these exams. So such is the state of joblessness in the country. And uh, I think at some point it's going to get really frustrating. I think it already is. And within the private ecosystem in the country, I think the kind of salaries that some people are enjoying, it's going to create a lot of frustration. I have seen it myself that C-suite employees in India in, in let's say, the SaaS ecosystem or, or any other, let's say, tech or financial startups, the kind of salaries that they're enjoying, it's ridiculous. I sometimes think about this and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like that's not the kind of money you should be paid for just sitting in meetings all day. Now, there are people in this country who are, you know, working all day doing manual labor and they are just, they are not being paid properly, right? I read a report on Scroll in in which uh, in the wake of labor laws being done away for new industries in some states just to kind of kickstart production and manufacturing after the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns. 
I've read reports where laborers have complained that they have been chained in the factories and they've not been compensated at all, not just for like one or two days, but at all. They've they've just been asked to do this labor and they've not been compensated and there are no labor laws to protect them either. So I think that it is getting worse uh, seeing the kind of riots that are happening in country uh, in the country. I think last night I read about a riot in Anash or something. I don't think any person who has a job has the time to indulge in something like this. You know, joblessness kind of gives, how can I say, you know, it breeds uh, lawlessness also. Because if you don't have time to spend at a job, you're going to get frustrated and you have to divert your attention somewhere else. So it's going to get worse. On that note, now that we've talked about selective theory and elite culture, uh, elite capture, I have two other points that I thought we could talk about. So one is, which I mentioned that, you know, when firms decide to pay more than the equilibrium wage, for example, they are restricted by the number of employees that they can employ. And by that, I mean that they can't afford to employ more people because they've increased the wage that they're offering. Now, in that case, what happens is that there are a lot of low cost labor available. So do you think that it benefits the government? I think it it does benefit the government because India is a country where infrastructural development is needed at a large scale and availability of low-cost labor is great for the government, right? Because uh, it's, it's, I mean, I'm sure that it's taken into consideration where budget is planned for a certain infrastructure activity. I would like to know your thoughts. No, I think I do agree with you that the fact that you can continue to pay low skill labor, low wages because of the fact that, you know, you always say that skills have a premium that comes with it. So you only, and you know, for a fact that all of your agricultural labor is going to be absorbed only by three particular sectors of the economy. And you know that they will tend to keep that wages really low. And if you keep promoting just those sectors, then I think that does hint at something that you did mention that, you know, it is another form of elite capture in and of itself. If you think that you're going to only flourish industries where the elite can keep the wages low, you're also only flourishing industries where people probably don't have to upskill. So you never really close the skill gap that is leading to this unemployment problem to begin with, wherein even though private sector has a lot of job openings, you never get qualified candidates to fill those positions. So I do think that it's a part, it's a problem of a larger ecosystem as well, where our jobs are being created in sectors, or at least those sectors are being fostered in places where you don't really have to make any large scale changes to your own policies as the government. And you can keep doing what you've been doing since day one and hope that no one ever counters what you have to think and what you have to say, because you keep providing some sort of poverty innovation to people and it, it's sort of people are myopic. We can't forget that the poor tend to be highly myopic in nature. They don't think about long-term savings. They don't think about long-term planning a lot of the time because that requires a lot more cognitive ability than they do have the space for. And given that they do such a, so much physical labor. And when you're saying that I'm going to keep giving you these jobs, I'm going to keep giving you these benefits, you're getting short-term benefits. Why would you ever consider the possibility of a long-term reform that could significantly alter your life yeah makes sense and it kind of brings me to my last point which i read in a paper yesterday that a rational person will always go for a contract job as opposed to let's say a long-term job that play pays less because they need immediate money and that's what i think a lot lot of the poor people are in the situation right now in india which is why contract labor is on the rise uh with that i think we can end this podcast if you have any final thoughts uh, would you like to say anything i think just like my final thought would be that for the longest time our political elite and our economic elite have been closely intertwined we've had a huge influx of people from the economic elite now running for elections so the conflation between these two groups is now even larger than ever before that we've seen you have industries running for elections You have people who are closely tied to industrialists running for elections. And you have to understand that if you're coming to this kind of political power, you came in because of these networks. Simply coming to power does not grant you altruism. So, and unemployment is a highly political issue. It's just seen in simply the way you define unemployment, where your statistics in the US range from unemployment 
one definition of unemployment and the most comprehensive definition of unemployment, the difference is threefold. And that's because unemployment is so political, you can't ever portray a very large unemployment number because it will lead to chaos. Yet India has had high unemployment for a really long time and things aren't changing. People don't seem to be agitating about this as much simply because the state has been providing you with some sort of direct cash transfer, some direct benefit transfers are happening and you're happy. Or people are at least momentarily alleviated. But I think there's a need for this idea that the policy is being guided by the conscience of the elite, as Varshne pointed out, that needs to go away. You need to have policies that are motivated by economics rather than by simply electoral success. And only that is how the... And political, uh, that unemployment will remain political, but the idea is that we need to ensure that it is not motivated simply by electoral success, but also by a long-term vision that India needs to develop. And for India to continue competing at the stage it has been with its growth and its industries, it's important that unemployment is tackled and our human capital is properly utilized. Yeah, and we can only hope for the best. <laughs> Okay, thank you for joining me, Arushi. And thank you for listeners who listen to us. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. Hey, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On The Habit Coach, Ashton meets Devangana Mishra. She is the CEO and founder of Brain Bristle. And this Autism Awareness Month, they discuss how we can understand autism better. The simplified hosts ponder over how form dictates content, whether it's going from CDs to streaming or blogs to Twitter. On Voices for Water, Karthik talks to Dr. Veena Srinivasan. She is the lead of the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation. They deep dive into the importance of investing in water waste treatment. On Say No to Drama, Chetna tells us why work friends are essential and how they influence our overall performance. And on All Things Policy, the Takshashila folk analyze the implications of China's genetic resource guidelines. Do follow us on social media. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on, including the one you're listening to us on now. And also, please do check us out on YouTube. We have a number of channels. They're all available on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. We're also doing a small listener survey to help us understand you, the listener, better and how you like our shows, how you respond to the advertising, and so on. We'd really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to spell it out. It's at ivmpodcast.com slash survey. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, SBI Life Insurance, India Water Portal and Jupiter, a digital banking app. Thank you so much for making this possible. You're the people pleaser, right? Or then desperately seeking the one? Oh wait, you're the one who doesn't think they're ever good enough. So much drama. And for what? Is it doing you any good? Listen to me. I'm Chetna, your favorite positive action coach. Yes, I'm the one who has been dropping all those truth bombs on every episode. I know. And it's time you learn to say no to drama. That's also what my podcast is called. And a new episode is out every Monday and Wednesday on the IBM Podcast app, website, as well as all major podcasting platforms.